strange thing to be here accepting this award on Aaron's behalf and not know how he would have felt about it. I can't tell you what Aaron would have thought of being named the EFF pioneer, of keeping the company of people like Jamie and Glenn and Laura, of sharing New York Times column inches or the front page of Time magazine with Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden. I'd love to say that he would have been thrilled. I think certainly part of him would have been. I think he might have been embarrassed, too. And I think he would have felt that this was premature, that his best work wasn't yet done. I think we would all agree. Being with Aaron was many things. It could be, by turns, infuriating, hilarious, irritating, delightful. I'm sure as many friends in this room um, can sympathize with those experiences. But one thing I can never accuse him of was being boring. He had a knack for inserting himself into the middle of the biggest debates, the hottest moments. Sometimes it seemed almost coincidental. Two years ago, on one of my visits, after he had moved to New York, but before I joined him there, we were exploring Lower Manhattan on a Saturday, which I don't even know if it was a Saturday, um, and we unwittingly stumbled, just walked past, literally the very first Occupy March on Wall Street. We stopped and watched for a while, and we were like, well, that's not going to come to anything, right? <laughs> Later, I remember him calling me from Occupy Boston and waxing poetic about the profound effects that his first experience of the ritualistic communal incantations of the people's mic and how he um, felt about that. We slept out at Zuccotti Park on a beautiful October night, uh, scooting on cardboard boxes, serenaded by the drum circle. <laughs> sometimes he stumbled upon these historical moments, but sometimes he sought them out. Supreme Court case that Larry argued where he messed up. The work he did on RSS and Open Standards and Reddit. The second time we ever met, months before we started dating, was at the Wisconsin Capitol building. Each of us had flown there for the weekend from our separate cities to join the protests, or perhaps more accurately, experience the protests. I think both of us saw ourselves as observers and students more than as participants. But as diligent observers, intent on getting as much out of the experience as possible, we marched the picket lines together and slept on the marble floor. Sometimes Aaron stumbled upon these moments. Sometimes he sought them out. But sometimes the whirlwinds and firestorms he found himself, found himself swept up in were created by himself. When we first started dating, I hadn't heard of SOPA. Six months later, you could hardly find anything else on the front page of Reddit. Aaron Crick won that fight alone. Many in this room tonight were instrumental, but the war might not have been waged without him. As went his life, so went his death. His prosecution and his resulting suicide were at the center of a brewing maelstrom. That maelstrom is the fight over the surveillance state, over our government's attempts to control and contain information. It's the fight over the future of the internet, of human privacy, of access to knowledge and information. It's not a maelstrom of Aaron's creating, but his death both was caused by it and fed it. And it is a maelstrom that EFF is at the center of. Thank you, all the staff and supporters of EFF in this room, for the work that you do. Shortly after Aaron died, I was reminiscing with Peter Eckersley, EFF's chief technologist and one of Aaron's best friends. I told them that one of the worst parts, one of the many, many worst parts of Aaron's death, was that the world was going to keep changing, and I would never know what Aaron would have thought of the new developments. I'd been counting on 20, 30, 50 years of getting to see the world through Aaron's lens. New technologies, some of them developed by us in this room. New social movements, some of them, some of them spurred by the people in this room. New forms of social interaction, of artistic expression, heck, even just new TV shows that we watched together. I was counting on 20 years of Aaron's insights and reactions, 30 years of loud arguments in the elevator about developments in artificial intelligence and Fed policy, 50 years of refusing to let him forget when his predictions had been wrong. <laughs> That's what's been most difficult to wrap my head around since he died, that I will never know how he would have reacted as the world changes and how he would have changed the world. And what a first eight months it's been for him to have missed. I wish Aaron had been alive when Glenn first published Edward Snowden's documents. I can't tell you 
for sure what he would have thought, whether he would have been surprised by any of the revelations, what brilliant campaign angles he might have come up with to capitalize on Stokes' courageous acts. In these ways, I can't model Aaron very well. It's what made him interesting. He was too complex. But in other ways, I knew him like the back of my hand. He had principles, threads that ran through all of his work and thinking. They were remarkably simple, these principles, but strikingly rare. So I was struck the other day um, when I came in across insights into them in a recent op-ed in the New York Times by philosopher Peter Ludlow. His article about the moral dimensions of Aaron's actions, of Jeremy Hammond, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden's cases shifted some important things into focus for me, and so I wanted to talk about them here. Ludlow titled his op-ed, The Banality of Systemic Evil, in a reference to Hannah Arendt's phrase, The Banality of Evil. He reads this phrase not as an observation about what a regular guy, Adolf Eichmann, seemed to be, but rather a statement about what happens when people play their proper roles within a system, following prescribed conduct with respect to that system, while remaining blind to the moral consequences of what the system is doing or at least compartmentalizing and ignoring those consequences. Much of Ludlow's op-ed revolves around one of Barron's favorite books, Moral Mazes, by sociologist Robert Jackal. If you haven't read it, you should. Go home and order it tonight, seriously. It's a brilliant study of the ethics of decision-making within corporate bureaucracies. Aaron referenced it often. It shaped his worldview in many fundamental ways. To Aaron, Moral Mazes explained how so many well-intentioned can commit so much evil collectively. Moral Mazes outlines the five fundamental rules of corporate bureaucracy. One, you never go around your boss. Two, you tell your boss what he wants to hear, even when your boss claims he wants dissenting views. Three, if your boss wants something dropped, you drop it. Four, you're, sensitive to, you're so sensitive to your boss's wishes that you anticipate what he wants. You don't force him, in other words, to act as a boss. Five, your job is not to report something that your boss does not want reported, but rather to cover it up. You do your job and you keep your mouth shut. Here's a quote from Edward Snowden about operating within the surveillance state, which sounds eerily similar. When you talk to people about abuses in a place like this, where there is a normal state of business, people not, tend not to take them very seriously and move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up and you feel compelled to talk about them. And the more you talk about them, the more you're ignored. The more you're told it's not a problem until eventually you realize that these things need to be determined by the public and not by somebody who is simply hired by the government. We've seen nothing but classic bureaucratic responses to Snowden, to Manning, to Aaron, to Aaron's death. MIT's report came straight out of the moral basis of playbook. From Steve Hyman to Carmen Ortiz to Eric Holder to Barack Obama, not a single government official has stepped outside of those five fundamental rules. The thing that Aaron Snowden and Manning have in common is that they were constitutionally unable to submit to the expectations of bureaucracy. They were too impatient, too principled to navigate its moral basis. Ludlow writes, systems are optimized for their own survival. And preventing the system from doing evil may well require breaking with organizational niceties, protocols, or laws. It requires stepping outside of one's assigned organizational role. The chief executive is not in a better position to recognize systemic evil than is a middle-level manager, or, for that matter, an IT contractor. Recognizing systemic evil does not require rank or intelligence, just honesty of vision. There is a moral principle at work in the actions of the leakers, whistleblowers, and hacktivists, and those who support them. That moral vision may just save us from a dystopian future. Aaron would have agreed, and he would have urged each of you, each of us, to follow that principle in our daily lives. To stand up for right and wrong within the bureaucracies and organizations that all of us navigate in our work. The lesson we learn from Aaron's life and death cannot be to hold tight, to refuse to rock the boat in case something goes wrong. The lesson we must learn is that enough, if enough citizens act with the honesty of vision that these whistleblowers do, we cannot lose. And if too few of us do, we cannot win. Aaron hated San Francisco. 
<laughs> he said it was because there aren't enough books in this city. I moved here in part this month to escape him, because unlike the other cities I could imagine living in, we never came here together. The streets of San Francisco don't remind me of him. The food, the trees, the weather, the offices, the parties, I have no memories of him here. And yet he's everywhere. I can't get away from him. He's present on the internet in almost every possible sense of that word, that phrase. You can read about him on 10 million websites. You can still tweet at him. You can still use the tools he wrote. He's present in the work that EFF is doing, and the work that his co-founder, David Siegel at Demand Progress, who's somewhere in this room, is doing, and the work that Jamie and Glenn and Laura are doing. He's present to many of the people in this room. He's present in the growing movement for open access among librarians and academics. He's present in the ongoing fight for a free and open internet. He's present in every minute that those of us whose lives were touched by him spend fighting for social justice. We can't get away from him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to. <laughs>